I've been away from you so long, I, I want to welcome you. And if you're here for the first time, I want you to know that I love this church. And not because they give me a paycheck, though I'm grateful for it. And not because um, I got to be a part of a team to help start this church. I love what God has done in this church. And I am moving into 2013 with great expectations for what's ahead for us. And so um, if you've been around here for a while, jump in even further. If you're new here this morning, I hope that you will um, really get a heart for what you experienced this morning, that it'll be meaningful to you and, and that it'll be helpful to you. And so let us know at the end. I mean, you know, write it to me later. Don't tell me right after the service because that's when my self-esteem is really low. Um, just kidding. You can tell me when, whenever. Um, I want to get all of our focus headed towards 2013. And so I'm going to do that in just a moment. And that's kind of where we're going the rest of the morning. But before we get to there, I want to invite you to celebrate something super significant in regards to the Hope Project. We had a $50,000 goal to fund all the things Lindsay just mentioned. Um, and then we also had a goal of a goat for our kids' ministry to give to to help really um, fund a family in another part of the world. And so $50,000 goal, it lasts till January 31st. So we're still, I don't know, what is that, 25 days away from our goal. Would you guys like to see where we are as of this morning? And before I show you this, really? You guys are that excited about this. This is great. We're sending money all around the world to do things for Jesus. And yeah, that's, uh, woo. Um, we should be more excited than that, but, but you'll, you'll get there. Before I do, I want to say uh, two things. For those of you that have given, thanks so much. I believe that God is raising the bar of generosity in our church. And if you haven't had an opportunity to give yet, you're not off the hook just because of what you're about to see. Okay? We clear? We had a goal of $50,000 plus a goat. And as of this moment right now, here's where we are. Not bad. $63,353.73. And the kids' ministry, while we're bragging on you adults and your generosity, let me tell you how generous our kids were. We had a goal for them to get one goat. I believe it was $75, however they could work it, steal it from their, I mean, not steal it from their parents, but you know how, you know how it goes, uh, get a loan from their parents, uh, you know, change the door. Uh, and they purchased four goats so far. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. So super excited about that. There's still time to give through the rest of the month. And here's what happens. We, we, just don't, don't think, well, we need to just stop now um, or, or you need your money back and since we over, went over the goal. But um, the extra is going to allow us throughout 2013 as opportunities arise, as we hear about new churches starting in North America, around the world, significant ministries here in San Francisco, we'll be able to come together. You, go, you know what? Our people were so generous. We can actually fund that before we even have to wait for the next Hope Project. And so that's what we're about. And we'll let you guys know what that is. 100% of everything will go to the kinds of things we're already doing. So um, know that ahead of time. And now I do want to focus us for 2013. Um, our series we're starting this morning is called Reset. It'll be about a five-week series. And I really believe that's perhaps the most appropriate word as we begin this new year together. Um, we know this idea of reset, right? Like if your phone goes crazy, you, there's this reset button. Or if you're playing someone in a video game, I know just with your nephews and nieces, you know, you don't like video games. But if you're playing someone in a video game and they're hammering you, you need to know where the reset button is, right? Resetting gives us a chance to start over. It allows us this opportunity to realign ourselves with what our values are, what our priorities are. It gives us uh, this moment just to kind of clear things away and go, okay, the page is blank. I need to think about where I should make course corrections to how I've been living. Because what happens in my life and in your life is that we just start running with activity, right? And sometimes we go months, even years, before we stop to pause and realize, wait, why am I doing what I'm doing? Why do I think the things I think? Why do I do the things I do? Why do I spend my time the way that I spend my time? And so as we kick off this morning, we're going to do a five-week series really about fresh commitments that you and I need to make. It's easy to make commitments, right? Anybody already broken a resolution? That's good. That's good. Some of you are honest. <clears throat> All of you that promise not to lie are already um, breaking yours. What I want to give you this morning is one goal. I don't want to give you 10 resolutions. I don't want to give you 15 areas of your life with three bullet points under and say, hey, if you get these 45 things right, you're going to have a great year. I want to give you one thing. And this one thing, if you get it right, I believe it could be the most productive and fruitful year of your life. And if you don't get it right, I think all bets are off as far as what the year will be like that you're going to have. One thing, and this idea of reset is that we, we want to just push the reset button and go, okay, are, are, are we doing the things with our life that we want to be doing? Right? Because at the end of the day, 
However you and I spend the sum total of our time will in the end be how we spent our lives. And as you consider the trajectory that your life is on and how you spend your time and how you spend your money and what you do with your relationships and what you do with your vocation, is it headed towards a direction where you'll be able to get to the end and look back and go, I'm so grateful for how I lived? Or do we need to hit the reset button and go, you know what, I need a, I need a few course corrections in a variety of ways. And so we'll approach some different categories over the next five weeks. But this morning is really, here's your one goal for 2013. Get this right and you'll be the right kind of spouse. Get this right and you'll be the right kind of friend, employee, employer. Get this one right and you'll be the right kind of neighbor. Get this one right and you, I believe, will live out God's purposes for your days on this earth. Get this one right and 2013 will likely be the most fruitful year you've ever had. And so I want to look at a text and the book of Ephesians in the Bible. It's towards the kind of middle to back end of the New Testament. So if you have a Bible, turn to Ephesians. Feel free to use a table of contents. If you need one, our volunteers are already on it. Just raise your hands and they will get, get you a Bible into your hands. This is your gift from us. If you want a nicer one, we'll even buy you a nicer one. We'll take it out of Tim's salary, but we will buy you a nicer one if you want one. We believe here at Epic that the Bible um, really is God's word revealed to us, and so we take it seriously. Um, and, and we want to be in the habit of valuing it and, and, and gaining insight from his word. And so that's what we're about. Um, in Ephesians, if you've never read this um, six-chapter book in the Bible, it's a grand book. It is so full of who God is, um, how rich his mercy and grace is. Uh, it tells us about where we are without God, but then where we get to be when God comes into our lives. Um, it talks to us about big faith. It talks to us about how we should live relationally, even sexually. It talks to us about that. It talks to us about how to do marriage, about how to um, engage in, 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 in spiritual life. And in chapter 5 is where I want to spend our time this morning. Chapter 5, starting in verses 15, reading through 21, I want you to really see in this text, it is explicit. There's this one thing that if you get right this year, it's real explicit, straight from the text. If you and I get it right this year, I think it could be the most productive and fruitful year we've ever had. So Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 21, would you all stand with me? Just a way we honor um, the scriptures around here at Epic, and uh, I don't think there's anything inherently uh, magic about standing while we read, but just saying, hey, we want to hear from God. And so let's open our hearts and see what God might say to us this morning. Ephesians 5, 15 through 21. Paul says, he's saying a lot of things before this. He's talking about sexual immorality. He's talking about how God has changed our lives and really shown the light in our hearts. He's talked about how we need to arise and awake to the reality that Jesus is in our lives. And then he says, in light of all this, verse 15, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. You may be seated. In a moment, I'm going to give you that one thing that I think is crucial. I'm really going to give you that one thing that as a family and even as my staff here in my own life, this is how I'm going to evaluate my 2013. And I want to invite you in just a moment to evaluate your coming year, the year that we've just begun. I want you to evaluate it in line with this one idea, this one phrase, this one statement. But before we get there, let me say this to you. Knowledge usually isn't our problem, is it? Can we just be honest? Knowledge, we need to get more of it, but knowledge usually isn't our issue. Okay, I did not eat three cinnamon rolls yesterday because I didn't know better. That's a true story. A lady in our church baked them, and you know you gotta, you know you gotta save face for the parishioner in your church, and so you gotta just go for it. And I did. Um, I did it after I exercised too, which was awesome. Uh, so I got one goal down, messed one goal up. Um, but but I didn't eat those cinnamon rolls because I didn't know better. Does that make sense? Uh, we're going to talk a lot about how to attain knowledge in our church, and we wanna, uh, we're going to talk to you about reading the Bible so you can understand who God is and what he wants us to know. And, and you should be the best at what you do, which it means an, uh, continuing education, whatever your thing is. Um, but our problem usually isn't knowledge. Our problem oftentimes is we don't consider the ramifications and implications of what we're doing with our lives. And so Paul says right off the bat, before he gives us this one thing, he says, look carefully then how you walk. Um, he's just essentially, the word walk can be translated live, right? He's just saying, be careful how you live 
not as unwise, but as wise. Because here's what Paul knows and what you and I know if we think about it. No matter how smart we are or spiritual we are or how skilled we are in our industry, it doesn't mean that we're going to live lives that are wise, does it? In knowledge issue, yeah, increase in knowledge, but the thing that we need to give weight to is wisdom. The thing that we need to consider is what would it look like for me to live a wise life? And so Paul says, look carefully, because here's why. If you just go through life doing the same old, same old thing, if you just let life kind of flow your way and you respond to it, you become reactive to it, you just get in a habit and you're just doing your thing, typically what will happen is we will end up living lives that are not wise and we'll end up living lives that we're not very careful about, okay? And so um, if you've not done so as we've completed 2012 and as we begin 2013, this reset idea is what I want you to, to just push the reset button and consider afresh what your life is about, what you're giving your time to, what you're giving your life to, um, what are your priorities, what does your checkbook say about what those are, what does your schedule say about what those are. And so before I give you the one thing, I just want to say, would you please consider how you're going to live this year before you just start living this year? And then Paul gives us the one thing in verse 16. Feel free if you have a Bible to look at it or it'll be on the screen, verse 16. Here's the phrase, making the best use of the time. What's the one goal? Like, Ben, that doesn't really blow me away. If you do it, it will. That's not really, like, super deep. If you do it, it will lead to a deep and fulfilling life. Make the best use of the time. You want everything else to fall into place. You want to get to the end of the year, have few regrets, have lots of peace and lots of joy. Make the best use of your time. You want your relationships to flourish and thrive. Make the best use of your time. You want to do the best you can in your vocation. Make the best use of your time. You want to do your best when it comes to serving in the city or even around the world. Make the best use of your time. This is it. If you and I get this goal down, I think a lot of other things are going to flow out of that and fall into place. But we've got to give consideration to it. If we take inventory on this past year, and it's not about getting it perfect, but how many of us would go, yeah, I've really made the best use of my time? Well, the question is, if we're supposed to make the best use of our time, how do we know what the best use of our time is, right? We all have an idea about what the best use of our time is, but how do we know? Well, Paul goes on in verse 17, he says, Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not be foolish. You see this wisdom thing again? The opposite of being a wise person is being a fool. Yeah. Yeah, you can say that, okay? I don't know if you're somebody, your mom probably kept you from saying that, but when it's a fill in the blank moment in church, you can say it. Um, do not be a fool. And you're like, why does Paul keep hammering this? Because he's been around humans long enough to know that we don't typically go the route of wisdom. So he says, look carefully. Don't be unwise, be wise. Don't be foolish. And then he says, understand what the will of the Lord is. Well, that just adds another question, right? What's the will of the Lord? What is the will of the Lord? And how, how can we know what the will of the Lord is? Now, before we get to this will of the Lord question, in verse 16, when it says making the best use of the time, another way to translate that phrase, making the best use of, is the word redeem or purchase. It's the same word in Greek, the language that the New Testament was written in. And so think of it in this way. He's saying redeem the time. Make the best of, make the most of, redeem or purchase the time. And so before we jump into the will of the Lord, we need to ask ourselves, how are we redeeming the time God has given us? How, how are we giving the time back to God and saying, hey, you've handed me this time. I want to redeem it. I want to make the most of it. How are others receiving the time that God has given us? How is God receiving the time that God has given us? How are we redeeming the time? And he says, don't be foolish with your time, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Understand what that is. And before we get into understanding what that is, the first question we have to ask ourselves is, am I willing to lay aside my will and do whatever God's thing is for my life? And don't rush past this question. This is the thing that I, when, even when I see the heroes of the Bible, this is the thing that they wrestled with most, right? That's why Mary, when she finds out she's gonna give birth to Jesus, she says, all right, may it be to me as you have said. Golly, this is crazy, but ugh, not my will, but yours. Jesus says it when he's going to the cross. It will be the hardest thing that every human struggles with. And you see it in two-year-olds, don't you? You see it in 22-year-olds too and in 62-year-olds. We want what we want. In fact, so much so that we tend to demand it. 
And we tend to have everyone else sort of live for our will as well, and we want to live for our will. But before we talk about God's will, we need to ask ourselves the question, are we willing to relinquish and lay aside our will this year? Because I believe if God has designed life to be a certain way, and he wants us to make the best use of our time, we're going to have to set some things aside so that we can do so. Okay? There's a great spiritual classic book called Spiritual Leadership by a guy named J. Oswald Sanders. And I'm going to give you a quote, the short quote, in just a moment. And it tells us um, something that's very freeing for me. And I've got extra copies of this book if you guys want it. But let me, let me give you this quote, and then I'll tell you why it's so freeing to me. Here's what Sanders says. I love this. He says, each of us has the time to do the whole will of God for our lives. Each of us has time to do the, how much of it? The whole will of God for our lives. Here's why this is very refreshing to me. Many nights I go to bed thinking there are so many things that I should have done with my life today. And sometimes I need to think that if I've chosen to do things that weren't for me. But other times we think that because there's just so much hurt in the world, right? So many people to help. There's so many people in my life that I need to give time to. And, and, and what I love is, is him saying, each of us has the time to do the entire will of God for our lives. So no matter how busy you are, no matter how many young children you have, no matter what your position is in your company, no matter what the entrepreneurial thing that you're trying to set up, no matter how much you travel, no matter um, what your hobbies take up in your life, every one of us in this room has enough time to do the entire will of God for our lives. Isn't that freeing? You don't need more time. God is not unwise when he allocates 24 hours in a day. This is so freeing to me. And you know why else it's freeing? Not, not just because it, it frees me from not having to do everything. It's freeing because God has called me to live out his will for my life, not everyone else's. And, and you do know that everyone else has a will for your life, right? Right? Your teachers have a will for your life. And you probably need to adhere to some of that. Your bosses, do they have a will for your life? Spouses, your parents. Everyone has a will for our life. Everyone has something they hold up. Our culture, right, has this will and sort of they want us to adhere to it and submit to it. But here's what's freeing. Your maker in heaven, God himself, has given you something he wants for your life. And at the end of time, he's not going to say, hey, were you busy? Hey, did you do everything you could have done during those years in San Francisco? He's not going to say, did you serve everyone? He's going to say, did you do with your time what I called you to do? But here's what we must embrace also. If that's true, this must be true also. We do not have the time to do things outside of the will of God for our lives. Many of us in this room are so busy, doing so much, question is, are we doing the things that God's called us to do? And can I just confess, as a pastor, there's, I want to I wanna, I wanna be able to have a meal with everyone in our church, and I want to be able to serve everyone, and then I still want to have a time to give all the people in my neighborhood. And one thing Shauna and I are just realizing is, you know what? We can't do everything for everybody, and here's what's freeing. We've not been called to. That's not what God has for me. And I don't know what the demands are that you've inherited for your own life, but check the list out and make sure that those are the things God has for you. And if they're not, understand that he can take care of whatever the situation is that you walk away from, okay? Now, there's some things you'd never need to walk away from, okay? Don't be like, well, I've got a four-year-old son, but I don't think that's God's will for my life to spend time with him. Um, Johnny, just don't get hit. Uh, that probably doesn't work. But some of us, I would venture to say, every one of us in this room are giving ourselves and giving our time to things that are things God doesn't have for us. And we have great arguments, but Ben, it's great ministry. Uh, but Ben, that person's really hurting, and someone needs to be with the hurting people. Here's why you don't need to do this. You're not God. You're finite. You're limited. You live within the bounds of time. And so what our chief role is on earth, I believe, is to find out, God, what have you made me to do within the bounds of my life, within my lifetime, within my days, within my weeks, within my months and years? God, what have you made me to do? And understand this, it's seasonal. For most of us, it's, it's seasonal. But some of us just need to let ourselves off the hook, right? God knows what you have going on. 
So you meet, I meet young preschool moms. We have quite a few in our church. I don't mean I meet them like on dating sites. I just meet them at the church, all right, before you guys go crazy. And they're like, Ben, I just can't do everything. I can't spend 30 minutes reading my Bible, and I can't be a part of this thing and that thing. And here's what's awesome. During this season, God's not called you to be a part of every one of those things. He knows. You're like, well, what's my deal? Well, he's called you to raise these children. Other things are part of that too. You can work. That's great if that's what he has for you. But some things are you're just going to have to set aside. Shauna and I have started making a list of all the things we're going to do when we're empty nesters. And it is getting long. But for now, we have a nine-year-old, a seven-year-old, and a five-year-old. And that causes us to live differently than we'll have to live when we lived without kids and, and, and that we'll live one day again. And they are getting out of the house at 18. Contract on that already. Just kidding. Just kidding. No contract. But God knows what you have. And you have the same time that the president of the United States has. And here's what's really cool. You have the same time that Jesus had and he confined himself to while on earth. People wanted Jesus to do a lot of things differently than he did. You remember the time when his good buddy Lazarus died and Jesus doesn't show up for a couple days? And if he's the son of God, what is he doing delaying? Jesus understood clearly what his mission from God was and he lived within those bounds. You do not have time to do all the things that God hasn't called you to do in your life. And let's not think that God's will is just some boring sort of spiritual religious thing like, oh, it's just a Bible and singing and all, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, when you rest, that's part of what God's will is for you. Now, some of you uh, are on the brink of laziness at times with that. But um, when you rest, that's part of what God has for you. When you enjoy good food with friends, thank the Lord, that's part of what God has for you, right? When you enjoy recreation, right? When you spend time with people that enhance your life, God is for those things. And part of it is just figuring out how do we know what the will of the Lord is? And when we think of God's will, we typically think very specific, right? Like we want to know when it comes to God's will, should we marry that person um, we want to know, uh, should we take the offer from that company? We want to know, uh, what city should we live in, God, and for how long? We want to know those very specific things, and God is interested in those things. Um, and I think he's saying San Francisco for the next 10 years, all right, but to whoever you are. Um, God's very interested in those things, but those things aren't the 90%. But here's what's encouraging. God has really revealed, I think, the 90%. And I want to give you three things that won't blow anyone's mind in this room, but if you do it, I believe you'll have a fruitful year. Let me give you three reset daily and weekly rhythms that I think can enhance your life. The first one is real simple, but if you do it, I think it'll matter. First time is, the first one is this, daily time in the scriptures. Da daily time in the scriptures. God has revealed so much to us, and we're closing this book and going, God, what do you want? What do you want? And he's going, um, here's what I want. Here's what I want. Gain wisdom. Understand who I am. Understand what I have for you. And there's a great app, and if anybody created a rival app, I'm, we'll, prom you know, we'll promote yours next week, but there's a great app called YouVersion, and it's got tons of translations of the Bible on it, um, but this is your one piece of homework for today. Download this app, all right? I mean, read it, but download this app. It's got all the Bible on there, so if you don't have a Bible, again, we'll get you one, but there, you can read it on there if you don't have your Bible with you. Um, but what I love about this app is it has tons of different Bible reading plans for anyone at any stage. The one I'm doing right now is called, uh, I think it's called Eat This Book. Anything with the phrase, you know, eat, whatever, I'm, I'm in. Um, but it's basically, it's going to take me through this year, uh, through the entire Bible, by doing it in chronological order with a psalm a day, something like that. But no matter where you are, like if you've never picked a Bible up, they've got, hey, read through the New Testament this year. It's got reading through the book of Luke maybe in 30 days. So it's not overwhelming, but it's a great place just to go, okay, because a lot of times you're like, where do I start, right? Anybody else? Is that just me? Like, oh, what do I read today? Well, just get on the plan and just follow it. And here's what's cool. When you miss a day, because you will, and God will forgive you for it, okay? You will. You'll miss a day. You can just put this button. At least I, I can do it on my phone. Not that I've missed any days, but um, if I had missed a day, you could put, push this refresh button, reset, actually is what it is, um, and it'll catch you up, and it'll, it'll just, it, you'll, you'll take longer to read it, but it'll catch you up with where you left off, no matter what day it is, so you don't have to feel guilty. Just hop back on. Um, but if you would be, be reading the Bible just in some daily way, five minutes, ten minutes, not like you just read something just to get through it, um, but actually going, okay, what is God saying to the people here? What is God saying to me through this? And is there any reflection I need to do on what he said or any action I need to take on what he said? It really can be that simple. 
Okay, it doesn't have to be a scary thing like we think sometimes. That's one. The second one is this, daily time in prayer. You're like, Ben, this is so basic. Yes, but most of us don't do this in an engaging, um, consistent way. Spend time daily in the scripture. Spend time daily in prayer. Let me give you four, not an exhaustive list. We'll talk about spiritual disciplines at the end of this month in this series. But let me just give you four things to consider as you pray. First of all, as you read your Bible, there's going to be prayers you're going to see in here. One of the great things to do is just to pray what you read. All right? There's some great prayers. Go to the Psalms. Go all over the New Testament, Old Testament. Just pray some of the prayers you see there. But there's four things that you can consider as part of your prayer time. One is just thanksgiving. And you see it in Ephesians 5 at verse 20 where Paul says to the Ephesians, give thanks always and for everything. And this is a game changer. You want to change the posture of your heart going into a day, begin the day with thanksgiving. You want to change because we all have enough to complain about, don't we? Some of you are still focused on that Sunday meter parking thing, right? It, it, it kind of ruffles my feathers too. But uh, we have enough to complain about. But let's begin to have the posture of our heart on a morning, day-by-day basis going, God, I thank you because you're God. Thank him for who he is. Thank him then for what he's done and what he is doing in your life and in the lives of others and in the life of our church. Just go, God, thank you. It's a game changer in the way you approach your day. It, it really is. Um, and, and, then, and then secondly, confession. That's just us going, hey, God, um, there are some things I've done that are outside of your will for me. And I just want to admit that, and I want to confess that, and I want to repent to turn away from that, and I want to turn towards you today, God. I want to put that behind me. And then petition, that's just what probably most of us spend our prayer time doing, just asking God for things we want and need. I want to tell you two things, and I'm serious about this, because sometimes we get other, uh, the other extremes. Two things I want to tell you. Make sure petition isn't the only part of your prayer. Number two, make sure petition is a part of your prayer. Does that make sense? Don't make it me, 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 God, center around me, God, the world exists because of me, God, make sure my dreams are fulfilled. No, but include it. Let him know what it is that you desire. And then intercession, just where we pray for other people, where we take time to pray for groups of people, our partnership churches, pray for Epic Church. I can only imagine what our church might see God do this year if daily, collectively, we approach him asking God to bless our church, asking for his favor asking for a movement of God's spirit, asking for God to change the lives of people in our church and in our community. I can only imagine what God might do in our lives this year if we joined our hearts around that idea. And here's a third one, and it it may not seem as obvious, but it's as crucial. Spend intentional weekly time with people who have learned and are learning to center their lives around Jesus. This is huge. You're like, but Ben, isn't my Bible and praying enough? I don't know. It doesn't seem to be the model in the scriptures, though. What I've learned, this is experientially, and I also believe it's what the Bible teaches and what Christian history teaches, what I, but what I've really learned lately um, is that I can't substitute really anything for the one-on-one time I spend with people who have learned how to follow Jesus and are a few steps ahead of me. Let me say that. I cannot substitute that, and I cannot tell it to you enough. Here's what I used to believe. I'm an avid reader, and I used to believe if I just read books and go to conferences, I'll become the kind of person I need to be. Do you know what my number one thing is right now? Spending one-on-one time with someone who can help me be more like Jesus in whatever area they've learned how to be like Jesus in. And I want to help you do that. I want to get you men and women in your lives. That, that, and you're like, Ben, here's my thing. Listen, the great thing about being able to lead our church is that I know much of the giftedness that exists in our church, and our small group leaders know it, and the rest of our staff knows it. We would love to just pair you up and say, hey, here's a woman, and we do this all the time. Here's a woman, or here's a, a man, and, and we, we do think the one-on-one works best if it's uh, the same gender, all right? Unless you're looking for a spouse, then we charge uh, a, a bit for that, um, but, but we believe that, that that's the number one way that we, um, in addition to reading the scriptures and praying, we believe, and there's lots of things we could go on with God's will, but we believe that one of the best ways to do it is to be with people who have learned and are learning. I would say are learning because um, we never arrive, okay? When you stop learning, you stop. And so be with people who are learning what it looks like to center life around Jesus. Um, and, and those are really, if you want to know what God's will is for you, do that. And, and I don't care what you call that person. You can call them a person who's discipling you. You can call it your life coach. You can call it your developer. You can call it your accountability partner. I don't care what you name it. But make sure it's intentional. Make sure it's weekly. Make sure you're asking them. I have a man who's about 60 years old. Some of, some of the people that I do this with in my life are in San Francisco, and some of them are outside San Francisco. I have a man that's about 60 years old, and he's done marriage, and he's done family really well. He has grown kids, and so when it comes to him discipling and coaching and mentoring me, I ask him questions about how did you have successful family times? 
I ask him questions about how did you continue to date your wife even when things were really busy and your kids were small. Have people in your life that can help you. And part of what this de- de- uh, demands, though, is verse 21, where Paul says, but submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. We love to submit, don't we? I think it's the one thing maybe that goes against our nature more than anything else, right? To submit to God's will means we have to let go of our will. To submit to other people, we actually have to go, hey, I'm interested and I want to learn from you. But the cool thing is that God puts people in our path. How do you know who those people are? Well, we'd love to introduce you to them, but sometimes if you just hang around after or before services, you'll get to know people. Join a small group when those kick off at the end of this month. Um, serve on a volunteer team and get to know people that way. Ask someone over for a meal. I mean, whatever the case may be, make sure that you're spending time with people. And part of the rhythm that needs to be ingrained in our lives is just this daily resetting. It's not enough to reset once a year. Agreed? So every day I want to reset. The way I reset daily, my alarm goes off at 6 o'clock. Shauna's goes off at 5.50. I guess she thinks she's going to win some prize or something. But um, mine goes off at 6 o'clock, and I have a cup of coffee and a cold morning of fire, my Bible and a journal, and I just spend time reading whatever the, my plan is for that day. And then I wanna, I'm going to ref- write down what I re- just reflections I have from the passage, if there's any action steps I'm going to take from that passage. And then just because it helps me stay focused, I tend to write out my prayers in the morning. I don't know what resetting daily looks like for you, but have a plan and then stick to it. It's worth it. It it is so worth it. Um, And then have a a way to reset weekly with people in your life who are going to make you, uh, help you be more like Jesus. Um, Let's close out just by getting practical right here at the end. Um, Three lists would serve you well if you're going to carry out this making the best use of your time. Let me give you three lists, and if you'll make them sometime today, sometime at least before the week gets going crazy, three lists um, that are pretty practical. One is uh, a list of things you need to stop doing. There's just things you need to stop doing. Make a list of that. Uh, Make a list of things you need to do less of. It's not that you need to give them up for good, but you just need to do less of them. And third, make a list of things you need to do more of as you start this year. Be intentional with this list. Staying practical, we all know that technology is a part of our lives, right? And for many of you and many people in our church, technology is your livelihood. The reason you have a job, the reason you are able to do something that uh, contributes to the good of the world is because you have this gift of technology, and we're so thankful for it. Now, the great discipline when it comes to technology is knowing how does technology aid or help you in making the best use of your time, and how does it hinder you from making the best use of your time. The great discipline is to know where is technology my friend when it comes to making the best use of my time from Ephesians 5.16, and where is it my enemy when it comes to making the best use of my time. Can we all agree with that? We know that we've all... been our own worst victim of this when it's gone bad, and we've all seen ways that technology has absolutely helped us. And so some of us need to just go, okay, what is the technology in my life that's not helping me at all, right? We need to drop that. And then from whether we ask people in our church, we have a strong tech community here at Epic, or other people, hey, what are the technology pieces out there that would really enhance me making the best of my time? And for many of us, it's not going to be that we need to add all these things or take away all these things. Some of us, it's just different time allocation with those things. So if God's will for you is to make the best use of your time, you need to know how does technology enhance that? How does technology hinder that? In what way is technology my friend when it comes to living out God's will? In what way is it my enemy? Okay. Another thing we need to do is um, we need to dispel a myth. And the myth has been around at least as long as I've been alive. Um, and, And we need to destroy it. But right now, many of us wear this myth as a badge of honor. Here's the myth. That somehow busyness equals productivity and fruitfulness. I'm so busy. I got so much to, oh, Ben, if you had my job. We all do that, right? And we wear it as a badge of honor. But here's what's crazy. It doesn't honor God. Can I say that again? Who cares if you didn't get to the end of your list? It wasn't the list God gave you. Who cares if you didn't have time to do the thing that you thought you had to have time to do? This is not what he's put on your plate. I could work 70 hours this week and it wouldn't guarantee that I would spend one of them making the best use of my time. And the same is true for you. And if you go, Ben, you don't understand. I don't understand, but I know that God does. And I know God has given a design to your life. And I know that, as Sanders said, he has given you enough time to do the thing he has called you to do. So the question we need to ask is, what are we wasting time on that God didn't give us? The question we need to ask is, what are we giving an inordinate amount of time to 
that's producing really no value in our lives. And the biggest thing, before we move into taking action on what we're talking about all morning, spending 2013 making the best use of our time, the biggest issue is still, will we set aside our will for his? That's the biggest issue. Watch young kids. Watch older adults. We want our thing done, our way in our time. But what we forget is that the heart of Christianity is not just saying, oh, I I agree with some of that. At the heart of Christianity is a Messiah, a Lord, a Master, a Savior, a God who demands that we follow him. And if you're going to follow, if I'm going to follow this year, we're going to need to center in on getting Ephesians 5.16 right. We're going to need to be people deeply committed individually and collectively as a church to making the best use of time. What needs to go away? What needs to be added? What needs to be lessened? What needs to be made more of? In Ephesians 5.2, I think you'll see it on the screen, but Jesus, or Paul was recalling the love Jesus had for us. Listen to what he said. He said, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. God's will has been at the center point of really everyone's life at some point, right? You, had to come, you have to come to grips with, am I going to do things his way or am I going to continue to set that aside and do things my way? If you're not familiar with sort of the moments leading up to the cross for Jesus, Jesus had this dramatic moment. And in this moment, he's in the Garden of Gethsemane and he knows what's ahead, the suffering and, and sort of being separated from God. And that's heavy on his heart and just Bro, just powerful way. And he says to God, if there's another way, take this cup from me. Like if there's another way, just take this from me. But in the end of his prayer, he says this, and we need to get to this place. He says, "Um, but Father, not my will, but yours. Jesus loved us and gave himself up for us in a sacrifice. If you're going to be a disciple of Jesus, if you're going to follow him this year, if you're going to make the best use of your time, I really think it begins by this commitment to set aside our will and to receive his. And what's great, his will isn't burdensome. It's not lacking in joy or peace. It's abundant and it's full and it's best. And I wanna just implore you, individually and us collectively, let's go pursue what he has for us this year. Would you pray with me? We really do wanna be a church that helps you as we're learning ourselves to follow Jesus, to really center life around him and to ask questions like, what does this mean for my time? What does it mean for my money? What does it mean for my vocation? What does it mean for free time? What does it mean for rest? If there's a way we can do that, please acknowledge that on your card. We'd love to be in touch with you this week and and, and be of help or get you connected with people that who could help. As you reflect, are you willing to really thoughtfully consider what the best use of your time would look like in this season of life here in 2013? What do you need to lay aside? What do you need to take up?